Will supercharging your C5 Corvette blow up your engine? Let's talk about it next. Toys for life. Guys, one of the most common questions I get on all my videos is Toys for Life. If I supercharge my C5 Corvette, will I blow up my engine? And in my mind, that is absolutely a fair question once you understand that by adding a supercharger to a C5 Corvette, <laughs> You're gonna increase the rear wheel horsepower from around 310 horsepower to 530 or even more. That, my friends, is a 220 horsepower increase, which means that your power on tap when you hit that gas pedal just increased by 70%. So with that kind of a massive bump in horsepower to a bone stock engine, it's absolutely reasonable for it to cross your mind that your engine might blow up. In fact, the exact same question crossed my mind back in 2015 that's when I first became aware of the a a Corvette and the ECS supercharging kits that were and still are available for our C5 Corvettes. And it absolutely blew my mind that they really were getting over a 220 horsepower bump to a stock LS engine without any internal modifications. Luckily by 2015, both a a and ECS had been in business for a number of years and I was able to find an abundance of threads on multiple forums talking about these kits and 98% of it, 99% of it was good. And if you know anything about internet forums, satisfied customers will hop on and maybe they'll tell a few people how satisfied they are with the product. Unsatisfied customers will hop on the internet and they will tell absolutely everybody how horrible the kit is. And I want to know what you're gonna do about it. Yes, yes. And so the fact that I could spend hours and hours researching on multiple forums and multiple threads through several years and find very little, if any, information about people blowing up their engines with either one of these kits, it was clear to me that these kits were very well engineered and extremely reliable. So at that point in time, I decided that I was gonna buy an a a supercharger kit, but I decided to hold off just a little bit because I knew I wanted to install the kit myself and I wanted to do all of the tuning and I wanted to take some time to improve my fuel injection tuning skills with a project vehicle I had at the time that I still have. It's a Pontiac Fiero and at that time I had just dropped in a 240 horsepower, 3800 supercharged engine out of a 97 Buick Regal in place of the Fiero's stock 96 horsepower four cylinder engine. So with the Fiero project, I was spending a tremendous amount of time modifying its supercharged 3800 engine. Things like a freer flowing exhaust, a performance camshaft, and ultimately I switched it over to E85 since its root style Eaton blower does not have an intercooler, unlike the C5 Corvette kits, which do have an intercooler. And of course, each one of those modifications requires changes to the tune so that the fueling curve is still accurate, timing is still optimized, and that has an automatic transmission as well, so the shift points have to be altered so they line up with the new torque curve from the camshaft and the 85. We also made about a dozen trips to the track over three years to get the wide open throttle tuning dialed in, and of course, to validate the final results. And in addition to all of the fun at the track and the drag racing and the wide open throttle pulls, we also had to make sure that on the street where the car is 99.5% of the time, that it maintains excellent street manners and drivability, and that the tune and the mods are dialed in so that the engine doesn't blow up. So after about three years of modifications and tuning on that project, the horsepower levels went from about 240 all the way up to about 375, and I feel like that combination is pretty much maxed out and to go much higher would take a serious amount of cash for exotic parts. And by mid 2018, I was more than ready and I finally picked up that phone and placed an order with Josh at a a for one of their C5 Corvette supercharger kits. A few days later, a gigantic box showed up and the installation was underway. It took me about two weeks working evenings and weekends, plus I was also shooting all kinds of videos of the entire process, which you can watch up here. And after that, it took me about two more weeks of proceeding carefully and cautiously 
to get the tune dialed in. It's hard to believe, but it has been over five years now and the kid has performed flawlessly on the C5. And during that time, it's included a ton of spirited street driving, probably more than a dozen trips to the track. And of course, a trip to the dyno to get that all important number. Other than the original installation and getting the kit dialed in on the C5's bone stock LS1, the only other thing I've done in the last few years is to alter the tune to allow me to burn E33 fuel. This gives the incoming mixture a little bit more cooling and allows me to run more aggressive timing, which bumped the horsepower up from about 540 at the rear tires to about 585. So with all of that backstory out of the way, which I felt was important so that you kind of know what my thought process has been this entire journey. Let's finally get to the question that you clicked on the video for, and that is, will adding a supercharger to my C5 Corvette blow up my stock LS engine? The 100% honest answer is, for your engine, it's gonna depend on a number of variables. Variables such as, how much horsepower are you going after? What is the durability of the factory parts that randomly ended up in your particular engine? How well your engine is tuned? Not so much the part about trying to make maximum horsepower, but rather the part about making sure that under all circumstances your engine doesn't experience any knock, also known as detonation or ping. How well you monitor or occasionally check to make sure that as time goes by you're not getting any knock or ping. How diligent you are about always making sure you use a high quality, high octane fuel. How long in seconds are you typically gonna be running your engine at wide open throttle, full boost? And finally, how well is your cooling system functioning? So let's talk about these variables in more detail. So variable number one, how much horsepower are you trying to make? When you order your supercharger kit, usually you have a choice from two, three, maybe even four pulley sizes, which are directly responsible for how much boost you're gonna make, which relates to how much horsepower you're gonna make. Even if you're super lucky and you've got the strongest LS engine that ever rolled off the assembly line at the GM engine plant, if you force it to make more horsepower than its weakest link can handle, it's gonna fail. The problem is there is no way of knowing ahead of time exactly how much horsepower your engine's weakest link can handle. It ultimately becomes an educated guess mixed with how much risk you're willing to take. Now, I'm not willing to take a whole lot of risk, especially when a replacement LS motor is gonna cost several thousand dollars. So after all the studying and research I've done, as well as paying attention to other people's real world experiences, it's my opinion that if you keep your rear wheel horsepower numbers to 550 or lower, your LS engine, if properly tuned and not needlessly abused, should last a good long time. And for every incremental bit of say 20, 30 horsepower, you go over the 550 horsepower, the risk of a catastrophic failure starts to go up exponentially. Variable number two, what is the durability of the components that randomly ended up in your engine from the factory, things like your pistons, your rod bolts, etc., and was your engine assembled properly, meaning, were all the bolts torqued properly and were all the clearances within spec. These two variables are 100% beyond your control and they're basically just the luck of the draw. But if your engine does have one of these shortcomings that hasn't presented itself under stock power levels, once supercharged, it is possible the shortcoming might reveal itself. As a specific example, let's take one of your pistons. If it happens to have had a casting defect that passed inspection and has survived in your engine at 350 horsepower up until now, once supercharged, those cylinder pressures are gonna increase dramatically and it's possible they could be too much for your piston to handle. This does sound scary and it is if it happens to you, but I'm not trying to scare you because luckily today's manufacturing processes are so refined and so consistent that the odds of this happening are very, very slim. Variable number three, and there's a few things that come to mind here. Number one, hopefully your tuner makes sure that your car's fuel system is up to the task mechanically of providing enough fuel at wide open throttle. And then within the tune, hopefully he sets up your mixtures on the rich side, which is what forced induction engines like. Relatively rich air fuel ratios for forced induction versus naturally aspirated are one of the tools in your tuner's toolkit that he has to help keep that incoming air fuel charge nice and cool, and that helps keep knock away. Second, once your tuner finds the ideal ignition timing for peak horsepower, hopefully they back it off a little bit. That allows your engine to remain safe so that when you leave the tuning facility, 
in the coming weeks and months and the air temperature changes, the air pressure changes, you go up and down hills so your elevation changes, even the quality and octane rating of your fuel changes, even if you buy it at the same gas station. Third, most tuners will desensitize the knock retard settings within the tune because the stock tunes are very aggressive and they pull out a lot of timing and they give it back very slowly. So it's not uncommon for them to tweak the settings so it's not as aggressive, but do make sure that your tuner does not completely eliminate the computer's ability to reduce ignition timing when knock is sensed. That simply, in my opinion, is not worth the risk. Variable number four is how well and how often will you be monitoring for knock? Now this is much less important on a naturally aspirated engine where the margin of safety is much wider and the computer can sense the knock, pull timing and adjust for it usually before any damage will ever be done. Once you add a couple of hundred more horsepower by supercharging, those cylinder pressures are greatly elevated. And while it's true the computer can still make adjustments and pull timing whenever knock is sensed, you have to be extremely careful because that margin of safety has shrunk and it's gonna be more risky to your engine than before when it was naturally aspirated. Therefore, the more horsepower you make, the more often you're gonna to wanna to scan your engine with something like HP tuners to make sure it doesn't have any knock. Or you could use something like the Aeroforce Interceptor, which can also scan for knock. It also has a little warning light that you can set to come on whenever it senses knock. It's nice and bright, so you'll notice it, and that way you'll know to lift off the throttle if it senses knock. Now someone's gonna say you can also hear knock as well, and that's true if you know what you're listening for and you're paying attention, but the stock LS knock sensors will absolutely hear the knock before you will. Let me know in the comments below if there's some other sort of technology or gadget that you like to use to scan for knock. Variable number five is how diligent will you be about making sure you always use a high quality, high octane fuel? This goes without saying, but the same octane fuel that was in your C5 when it was tuned is the same octane fuel you're gonna need to use each and every fill up from this point on, preferably from the same gas station. Variable number six is, what is the expected time in seconds that you will be at full boost? And what are your expected rest periods gonna be in between those wide open throttle pulls. If you're gonna use your supercharged C5 for spirited street use or the occasional quarter mile, you're gonna be at wide open throttle, full boost for 11 seconds or less, hopefully a lot less. During this time, your combustion chambers and your intercooler are gonna get pretty hot, but you can still tune pretty aggressively for this type of use. If you plan on using your supercharged C5 for road course racing tracks or something like the Texas Mile, you're definitely gonna be generating a greater amount of heat. If one of these is your intended use, I would suggest that you do proceed very carefully. You're probably gonna to wanna to reduce the horsepower levels and you're gonna definitely wanna find ways to manage and control all of that extra heat. And of course, it goes without saying, these longer types of events are gonna pose more risk to your LS engine. Variable number seven is super important and it really should have been right at the top of this list. And that is how many RPM are you gonna let the engine rev to? Now this is something I really didn't think much about before installing the kit. But once I had the tune in a place where I could actually do some wide open throttle, full pull runs, I discovered it was way too easy to blow right up to and pass the red line. And at that moment, it became apparent to me that I was gonna have to do some research into how many RPMs the LS engines can safely handle. Now, if piston and rod bolt strength weren't something we needed to worry about, I have no doubt that I'd be revving up to 7,000, probably a little bit more, but unfortunately piston strength and rod bolt strength are things we need to take into consideration. The first thing I think about is that it's my understanding that all LS engines, the LS1 and the LS6, starting in 2001, received stronger rod bolts. And I think that obviously had to do with the introduction of the LS6 engine and it revs to 6,600 RPMs with a factory red line as opposed to the 6,200 RPM red line of the LS1. A second thing to think about, and there is a little bit of conflicting information out there, but I do believe that all LS6 engines, because they rev higher, were also given a little bit stronger pistons that were made out of a slightly different alloy. 
So that's something to take into account and research further if you have an LS6 engine. So with that information in mind and all of the other research that I've done, I choose to rev my 2003 LS1 motor all the way up to 6,500 RPMs. Now, I did swap in a set of LS6 valve springs, which are a bit stronger to help prevent valve float. But other than that, it's a bone stock LS1 engine. If I happen to have an LS6 engine, I probably would rev it up to about 6,800 RPMs or so. But then again, I would go with a stronger valve spring to keep those valves from floating. If I had a 97 to 2000 Corvette, I probably wouldn't spin that engine any more than 6,300 RPMs, just because of the concern that those rod bolts might not be quite as strong as the later year engines. So unfortunately, at the end of the day, nobody can say for sure how many RPMs your particular LS engine can handle. But one thing we know for sure is the more RPMs you spin it to, the more forces the pistons, connecting rods, and bolts are forced to endure. And that, of course, increases the risk that something bad could happen. So choose your maximum RPM carefully. That's going to do it for this one, guys. If you think I left anything important out, please leave it in the comments below. If you got any value from this video and you learned anything, please give me a thumbs up so YouTube knows to share it with the Corvette community. But most of all, thanks for watching.